Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I am the, the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts. And here we have Carla Kelly from someplace else. <laughs> she does not live in Massachusetts and that's why we're really excited to have her here to have a conversation about her books and her writing and anything that we can think of. So um, first I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Library for supporting all of our programs. We couldn't do this stuff without them. And um, I wanna let you know a little bit about how we're gonna run this, this uh, program. So we're, I have a ton of questions. I'm gonna be asking Carla them, but she, you can also ask questions in the chat or you can, um, if you, I see that you're unmuted, I will call on you to ask a question. I just ask that you try to get your question in quickly so we can get to as many as possible. But if you put your question in the chat, I will ask Carla that question um, myself. So that's the structure. And, um, you know, I think we're ready to go. I would like to introduce Carla Kelly. I have talked to her for years and years and years, like through email and Facebook and things like that. But this is the first time I've actually gotten to see her face live. And I'm very excited. And she is somebody who uh, has been writing for a long time. She's written Regencies, which I absolutely adore. She's turned to Westerns and then not uh, World War II stories, which she'll be talking about today. Um, but she has an amazing history that I would like to learn much more about. So Carla, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm, I can't even tell you how excited I am. Well, I'm pleased to, I'm pleased to be here. It's a, um, it's a neat, it's a neat format. And uh, uh, like I say, you and I have been conversing various ways for several years. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah. Well, would you like to tell us more about yourself after my very lame introduction? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, um, somebody who knows who um, uh, put a, a pretty good description of me on Wikipedia. I don't know who it was, but you can always look at that. But I've um, I've kind of been influenced in my writing life by by the life I, I've lived. Um, my dad was in the Navy, and uh, so we were we were Navy brats. My my two sisters, one older, one younger. And we lived in a number of interesting places and met a lot of cool people. And the horizons are get, get so broad when you do that. And, um, and I've been influenced by so many people through the years as from where we've lived. And, and that's, that's been kind of cool. Um, one thing, um, you know, I, one tries to be somewhat introspective as a writer I guess but um it, I sort of fell into stuff throughout my life you know just oh that was fun I'll do another one of those you know whatever it might be but um I one thing that's influenced my writing is something that that was kind of a chain about my neck um uh, I stutter and I did this from uh, it was never real real severe and um I, I, when I was a kid, I, uh, I, I was never bullied. That was not the issue because pretty soon people realized, well, I'm, I'm a lot of fun to be around. So I always had a lot of friends. That's not the issue. It was just that it did something to me. Um, I would, I would, um, and, I, and years, not that many years ago, I, I figured it out. Um, it helped me become a writer. Um, some, and any any person with a stammer will tell you this. In fact, President Biden, I understand when he speaks about it. Um, you there are certain initial sounds that are that are difficult uh, for somebody that stutters. So what that did for me from an early age was um, it gave me a tremendous vocabulary because there were other words I could substitute uh, for the ones that are hard to say. So I did, and this you notice know, I get this huge vocabulary at a fairly young age, and that. I realize now what a plus that was, and um, and I would I would envy people who were fluent speakers. I did, you know, I mean, not nothing bitter or mean. I'm just a kid, but I thought, oh man, wouldn't that be neat? And so I started listening to how people talk and and what they say, and I know that helped me writing dialogue. <laughs> it just did because I I'm observing people, and the, the next thing I uh, when you do that. Um, I, I became an observer. Uh, I, I was never silent. Don't, don't get me wrong there. But I became an observer of people. And this is a, 
it, it's a terrific thing for a historian because historians are observers. And um, so all these things informed me to become what I am. So the thing that that I would have willingly changed when I was a kid, I realized did me a lot of good. So a little bit of introspection there. And uh, that's what writers do. I mean, kind of think about stuff, <laughs> probably more than we should. But um, so that's, and, and I got to show, I have to show you this. I, I, mean, I dug this out and found it. Uh, my mother, like good mothers, and I certainly don't win the award here. Um, she saved stuff that I did. When I was five or six, I wrote my first novel. Let me show it to you. It's called um, The Old Mill. I spent more time on the cover than I did on the story inside. Um, and I, I banged it out on her um, Olivetti Underwood typewriter. And it has um, seven sentences. <laughs> and, um, but it had a plot. It had a plot. It said that the Bartlett family was spending the summer at Pine Hollow. It was very lonely. Uh, well, here I'm, I'm telling you, not showing you. Um, at least uh, Bruce and Beth thought so. The only thing was a mile away, and that was the old Dutch mill. It was owned by Mr. E. Fuller, who was dead. <laughs> Get that one. Um, Bruce and Beth played by the old mill. Then one night, Bruce saw a light in the old mill, and he woke up Beth. And that's as far as I got. <laughs> but it had a plot. There's a light in the old mill. <laughs> so that, and I was five then, five or six. And um, did the usual high school things. Yeah, I mean, I mean, grade school things. You know, you wrote a little bad poetry and, and just was a kid. When I got to high school, we'd moved to South Texas. And I fell into the clutches of a journalism teacher there. Her name was Jean Dugas. Um, she never married. We were her children, she told us once. Ooh, she was... Um, Oh, she was mean. She was hard. She made us work, made us right. And we had to, you know, get it right. <laughs> and um, uh, I had an epiphany at the end, you know, we all, and I wasn't the only one, we all kind of vacillated between really liking what we're doing and kind of hating her because she was hard on us. Um, but um, I had an epiphany at the end of my sophomore year that if I paid attention to that woman, um, I would be a writer. And, uh, and this was no ordinary high school newspaper, I truly, it was outstanding. And um, so I started listening. I became, uh, there were two associate ed editors our senior year and then an editor. I was, well, I was the associate editor over features. And uh, that, so, so yeah, we need to go to college. So I got a degree, I have a degree or two, but, but man, everything I do today, I learned, I learned in high school. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> a little past the kindergarten thing everything I learned in uh, kindergarten that's funny yes wow yeah. um so I'm just going to start right off with a question from Lee who says are you planning to write any more books about master six they are my favorites I was I wrote three books um the attention the intention was to close uh, that third book um the unlikely heroes um is the battle of Trafalgar and I thought oh wow I've always wanted to write about it and, and that to me, and the story itself, I won't give it away, uh, wraps up the other, all the books. It does. But I discovered to my, <laughs> um, well, not dismay, my surprise that many readers have been wanting to know more about the gun wharf rats. So yeah, I'm halfway through book four. Okay, okay, good. Halfway <laughs> through book four. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's going to feature um, two of them. I, I can't do them all. Um, but yeah, I, I'll keep going because, and I wasn't going to, but I've been encouraged to by readers. <laughs> so well, yeah, the answer's yes. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're pretty excited about that. So, um, like I said to everybody, uh, if you weren't here at the beginning, feel free to put your questions in the chat. I'll ask Carla. And if I see you are unmuted, you can ask Carla yourself. Um, so I'm going to start it with my questions. What, because I love your historicals, Carla, you and I have talked about this before. In fact, I dug some of mine up from my bookshelf, <laughs> the early <laughs> ones. So I want to know what made you decide to write Regency? Well, my very, my very first novel was a book set in um, the, the colony of, um, the colony of New Mexico in what was it, 1693, there was, an, and there was an incident that happened then 
and um, I wrote it and, and I'd written a whole bunch of short stories and they'd done well. I'd gotten some awards for them, Spur Awards and other stuff, you know. And I, I was in Santa Fe picking up one of those awards and um, I thought, okay, this is a subject for an, an actual novel. So I wrote the novel and I had my agent by then and, and she sold it and did well. Um, for somebody that was totally unknown, it did fine. Uh, it's called Daughter of Fortune. That wasn't what I, I named it Saint Maker. That's the name I gave it. But once you sign your name to a contract, um, they can call it what they want. <laughs> and that's been an issue. I can talk about that later. But um, so I asked my agent, what, what, what should I do next? And she, she said, um, uh, have you ever read any Regency romances? I said, well, I'm a, oh, there's my sister. I see her in one of the pictures. <laughs> hey, Karen. <laughs> and Susan. <laughs> I, um, um, I said, well, yeah, I, I, I like Jane Austen, don't we all? And uh, uh, Georgia Hare. And she said, why don't, you, why don't you write me four chapters of a Regency? Uh, and, and four chapters, 150 pages, and you write it and I'll sell it. So I did and she did. And that was my first novel to Signet, which was, um, what was the name of it? Oh, uh, um, the, the, the last campaign, summer campaign, excuse summer me. Summer, summer campaign. campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Most of your fans know absolutely everything about your books. <laughs> And, and that started me, um, and they were good, and people kept wanting to read those. So I think I wrote 16 novels for Signet and, and a bunch of short stories. Um, I often get asked, um, um, how many books have you read? And I, I think it's about 45 novels, but I've never counted the stories because um, too many. <laughs> and so that's how it went. I wrote a bunch of short stories for them, um, and I enjoyed it very much. Mm -hmm. And then I, I wrote a little, yeah onward <laughs> that's got me going <laughs> so mary lynn and i actually have the same question about your characters uh being sort of non-noble characters yeah. um i think we were talking about this earlier is that reforming right lord ragsdale is one of my absolute favorite books but so is L uh, libby's london london's libby's london merchant <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> wherever the apostrophe goes i'm gonna you know i'll get it so um I, I'm really curious, as is Mary Lynn, and I think probably everybody here, is how you went in that direction that was completely opposite from the Regencies that were being written at the time. That's probably why I did it. Um, um, how many, I mean, as a historian, I asked myself, there were never that many Dukes in England. It's, <laughs> there just weren't, or Viscounts or Earls, and, and, um, so I thought, you know, why don't I try a different tack? Why don't I try more ordinary people? And 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 yet I do have royals. I mean, I have dukes and, and you know, well, there's one in uh, um, Libby's London Merchant. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just wanted to do it a little differently. Um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to copy anybody. I have my own ideas. And, and I know a lot of ordinary people. I'm one, most of us are. <laughs> and uh, so that's why I went that way. Because I thought I might have more to say that way, and I think I did about partly about class structure, mm -hmm. how it how it affects, especially in Libby, because she she's a wonderful person, but um, she's been duped by the <laughs> by the Duke, mm -hmm. and uh, and he he suffered for it. Oh, so many readers I heard from so many readers who said, "Oh, she married the wrong man." Oh, 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 oh. No, um, but I had to write a sequel to give him his story too, which I did. Incidentally, those two books, um, uh, uh, Signet hung on to those for four years. I have four of them that they hung on to for several years. The rest, I, uh, they gave me my, my copyrights back and they've been distributed to a couple other publishers. But um, they hung on to those for a while and that was fine. Um, but they were never uh, reprinted as books. And uh, so many readers, uh, I asked people, do you like an ebook or a book? Eh. Um, ebooks are great because uh, you don't, you know, I mean, never run out of something to read. So heaven forbid you have to talk to somebody. You've got a book all the time. But um, but people like books. So there are uh, four of those. Uh, Libby Slendon Merchant, the sequel, uh, One Good Turn, uh, <laughs> um, are, are being uh, uh, are being reprinted as both as uh, as yeah, as uh, paperbacks, soft cover and again, ebook. And the same with um, same with the wedding journey, which is one of my favorite books. 
and uh, uh, the Ladies' Companion. So they'll be coming out in the next two years. Carla, I'm going to get to your favorite book in a second, but I want to know, because this is my favorite book and I keep holding it up because I'm wondering if your new books will have the, these awesome signet covers, signet like covers, but um, for Lord Ragsdale, it's so different because he's not saved by the heroine. He kind of really has to figure it out himself. And mm -hmm. um, I just wonder like, how, how did that kind of turn in your head to make sure that it was, it was more real to life? Well, that's interesting because I've always been mystified by why, by why people like that one so much. <laughs> I, I, I guess, could go on. <laughs> well, I, I guess women like a rake, <laughs> but um, I don't really. Um, but he wasn't a rake, not in, not real. In my mind, well, he wasn't like if, compared to other regencies, he wasn't. Well, that's true. Yeah, so. that's true. But <laughs> so, it, and honestly, I, I made so much fun of him. He starts out. Uh, starts out drunk as a lord in the first few chapters and uh, he he commits himself to something he would never do if he were sober and um uh, yeah i i like people have to figure things out for themselves and he did um some people do some people never do but i, I yeah. like people to have that chance and and in so many of my books i don't have a lot of villains per se some <laughs> books but usually we're our worst villain Mm, we're harder true. on ourselves yeah. well if i remember if you don't mind i'm gonna just jump just jump in here hi mom um okay so <laughs> hi lord lord ragsdale that was like your first dark novel and that came from a place of pain if i recall because that was written right after mrs drew if i recall mm -hmm. and if you remember oh. uh i believe kevin had died just right after and or oh. right after Mrs. Drew. And so Lord Ragsdale, that really was one of your first darkest novels. It really, really was. And that came from a place of pain, which is it, you can you can see that. You can read that in in uh, mm. Costello. I oh God, I can't remember her first name. Costello's version, like her journey. That's painful. Well, so I, you know what's interesting about that is um uh, um uh, we're talking about Kevin, uh, Kevin Johnson. He was uh, my daughter Sarah's first husband who died in a car accident. And uh, she, their little boy wasn't even a year old yet. And it was so hard. And, and you're right. And, and I had a novel due. <laughs> and so I, I started writing. And finally, I, I, it was going nowhere. And I, I contacted my, my editor, sweet editor, that signal and said, hey, I can't do this. Can I try something else? And so I did. And yeah, I think it was right around then. My Lord Ragsdale, good comment, Liz. I appreciate it. And you do was, it, things. Things yeah. in your life affect what you write. You can't help it. Liz, did you have something else that you wanted to say? <laughs> no, Hi. no, no. I'm just really <laughs> marmy. <laughs> I know. I was going to surprise you. Anyway, no. I'm just thrilled to be here. I'm just, just. I'm almost crying. Thanks okay, no, I'm done. <laughs> Love you. Love you too. <laughs> that. So I'm going to, I'm just going to dig on that a little bit, like not about your own personal life, uh, Carla, but for us, it's been a, you know, for everybody, it's been a very difficult few years. And oh, so, yeah. um, you know, it's interesting to hear that, that what you just said about like your life affects your writing. Um, do you feel like that has been a case like all throughout, like when there's happy times, your books were, ha you know, like happier or how did that work for you? Huh, I don't know. I don't know if I have an answer for you. Um, isn't None of my books are particularly lighthearted. That's true. Um, but there's a lot of funny stuff in them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can laugh a lot on one page and cry on another, but that's life. Um, hard things happen to all of us. And, and yet we have those moments when things are so great and we're just, <laughs> life is good. And so that's tend to be how my story, stories are, but they, they truly are not lighthearted. I've, I've wanted to write a lighthearted story and I never quite managed it. But so I guess they're more, more realistic in some ways than some regencies for sure. Well, one of the regencies anyway, other books too. But yeah. Well, did you feel like, um, did it ever, uh, you said that your readers asked for, you know, certain sequels and, you know, more yeah. books and things like that. But did it ever bother you that when you were actually writing a story and the ending wasn't going to be what you think, you know, like the traditional ending? 
the, the pe readers would be upset? I don't know. I guess I never really thought about that. Um, um, well, um, I'm a great fan of Thomas Hardy and his wonderful novels. And, um, and I think of one, let's see. Um, oh, I can have the moment. <laughs> A little nervous here. <laughs> uh, what's the famous one? Uh, uh, f well, far from the madding crowd and uh, a duty obscure. Ooh, that's a that's a dark story. <laughs> far from the madding crowd has what I'd call a happy ending, but it's it's tinged with regret, with time wasted, um, people that wish they'd done better. So I I like it. And, and when you write for well, let's face it, when you write regencies, people expect a quote happy ending. The, the hero, the heroine, da, 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 so on. But I belong to the Tom, uh, 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 the Thomas Hardy school that says you better suffer on your way to that happy ending. <laughs> well, not suffer, just just live, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of what I do, and um, I never have really cared too much about <laughs> what people think um, because I know my stories are good enough that they'll follow it mm -hmm. if if I do it right. Mm -hmm. If I do it right, and sure. respect. I always respect my readers. I just, um, I don't talk down to them. I never have, and mm -hmm. so I don't. Well, I don't like that. Yeah. Well, I think that that's why a lot of us love your books is because you don't talk down to us first of all, but you also make your characters so relatable that even though they don't get the happily ever after that we expect, they do get a happily ever after. Oh yeah, and it it comes in hard ways sometimes, like that sequel to uh, to Libby's London Merchant. Mm -hmm. He suffers. And, and, and the woman he ends up with has suffered probably more than he has. Um, but he, he, he carries through. We, we carry on. We have to. We have to endure mm -hmm. because we've got a life to live. And, and they have their happy moments. They have their sad moments. They have their ones you think, oh, why did I do that? We, we've all been there. And if I've been there, I know my readers have. Mm -hmm. So I can relate to that. Right. But the suffering is again that part is relatable it's not like you know demons came and took my you oh, know no. whatever it's like it's it's something that any one of us could experience as you say oh yeah if if you live a life that's that's not cloistered you're gonna have both, both all emotions mm -hmm. and I like I like that because that's the way life is yeah and I think that that makes your books really powerful um, oh thank you in a very you know subtle way <laughs> So I have a question that's kind of out there, but did you get to hang out with your Regency writing peers when you were writing? Like I, I found my yearbooks amongst my, uh, they were mixed in with my Mary Bellog books. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I loved you both for so long. So did you get to hang out with these people? Never. I, I've never, I've never hung out with uh, any other writers, really. I've, I've never lived in places where they were, really. I've lived in, oh, um, well, when I was in Springfield, Missouri, we, we had an o Ozarks Romance Writers Club, and it was readers and writers, and that was fun. But that's the only time I I lived in North Dakota, no writers around, and and I I've never sought out other writers because um, I just I well I already I confessed to you earlier I uh, um, I don't read romance, so I really haven't read a lot of of, of other people's romance books and so they so they never influenced me because I don't read them mm -hmm. um well beyond Jane Austen and, and of course Georgia Hare she's still the icon <laughs> but yeah so no I I don't hang out with other writers <laughs> oh yeah um well that's interesting to know because um you know in, in talking to other writers through the last few years you know they all, you generally have a cohort they have a critique group they have you know, mm -hmm. other writers in their mm -hmm. life. So that's really interesting. No, I've never had a critique group. I, oh, this is going to sound egotistic. I don't mean it to. I, I, I didn't need one. Um, <laughs> and, and I, uh, I didn't. So I, and one thing my publishers have told me, which makes me happy, is uh, when they get a book for me, there's not much editing that needs to be done. Um, and I learned that in high school. Remember, I had that that fierce teacher that was a dragon. Mm -hmm. And um, she told us always to write, to tell the truth. And that's what I've tried to do through the years. 
Wow. Well, Liz says that writing is solitary, except with your kids around. <laughs> I got to tell you one time, oh, I was writing a, um, a Marion's Christmas Wish. And it, that story has, I, I don't use their names particularly, but the, the kids in that in that story are my kids, some of them. <laughs> um, oh, there's Percy, the diplomat. He's, that's my son, Jeremy, my oldest boy. And, and I like that. I remember one day I was I was trying to write. Oh, it was one night. There were teenagers, and uh, Eliza was the youngest, and she was not a teenager yet. But I, I did not win Mother of the Year when I said this. I said, "Look, guys, um, <laughs> what did I tell him? Um, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna dedicate this book to you, and I'll say I wrote this in spite of you." <laughs> what a terrible thing to say! I told you I didn't didn't win Mother of the Year that year, so. But uh, yeah, they're always around. And, and I, again, I observe my children. They, parts of them show up in other stories too, but Marion's Christmas Wish, especially. <laughs> That's funny. I have to reread it and uh, think of you and your kids at that time. I think, I think <laughs> yeah. Mary Lynn has a question. I, I see she's unmuted. I do. And I unmuted. So uh, I wanted to ask, first of all, you've now inspired me because North Dakota is not one of the states I've been to. And I want to get to all 50. Yes. Now I just need to go to North Dakota with a copy of my couple Carl Kelly books and find a coffee shop. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, the the question really for me is research, because in particular, I'm struck on some of your Western writings, like Here's to the Ladies, which is one of my favorites for the, Thank you. the breadth of the collection, because you've got things in there that a romance reader would go, okay, click, hang on, happy ending, hook, or at least kind of happy ending to things that really aren't. And it's it's obviously women of the frontier period, and that's different. And then you've got Regency, you've got, um, you know, you've got everything about the military in there, you've got the Navy, you've got various aspects of service. How did research work for you? What were your tools that you used to research that? And especially since you're indicating you didn't have beta readers, you didn't, uh, other than, you know, your children, which I fully understand, but where how did that work? Well, part of it is because of my major. Um, I have two degrees in history, okay. and I learned how to research. And uh, and and I um, when I worked at Fort Laramie as a ranger, that Fort Laramie National Historic Site. Um, that's when I wrote, and it is still one of my favorite books. <laughs> it's really good, yeah, because. Um, uh, the visitors would, uh, would would talk to us, and, and they would um, they would want to know about the lives of of the women and children. So I I did a lot of research, and historical research, what I do, um, and I thought, okay, I can tell these stories about women and children. I can make them interesting because I'm I'm a novelist. I was a very a beginning novelist then, and, and I can and I can tell the truth because it's history and I do not fudge history. Uh, I did once. <laughs> um, and, and so that's, that's how I did it. That's how it works for me <laughs> was to, um, to write those stories and, and they sold very well. And, and, and she says, some of them were, are not happy stories at all. And they're, they're kind of, well, uh, the one I wrote, the last one in that particular collection, uh, it's called Casually at Post. It's about the surrender of Sitting Bull in 1881 and about the Indians that that winter came across the border more and more. And, and there's this, this is based on research I did in the National Archives for, for a project for the state of North Dakota. And, um, but yeah, what happens when, when, when this, is, this is going on and, and the surgeon acquires a, a, a baby has been born and the mother is dead. The, uh, uh, these are Lakota coming from Canada. And um, his wife has, has just had a baby. So he, he sends the orderly. He said, come here, you got to feed this child. And, and she does. Well, what happens then? We have these two little babies that aren't very much different in age. Uh, they bond with that child. And what happens then? How do you, how do you deal with that? And, and so that's part of the story. And, and, and I have a tremendous collection of books on the Indian Wars. And that's why I wrote a lot of stories, uh, some more, more short stories than anything else about the Indian Wars. I have the research. And, and that's the thing about writing. And within the, with the, um, uh, the, uh, the Channel Fleet series, the Napoleonic Wars at Sea, I have the books. You don't just write one book uh, because you wasted years of research. So you see, how many stories can I create out of this one subject? 
and not, you know, bore people to death. But so that's part of the Indian War stories. That's kind of why they, and I love those short stories. And I have, now whoever that nice question lady, this book is contains some, um, several of the stories that were in here to the lady. I got permission to use those. And, and plus it has a few, a few original ones that I've written since then and, and, and went in that, that particular collection. So yeah, I mean, I just, I don't have to buy more research books because I got them with the Indian Wars. But <laughs> so and, you, and, have to, you have to tell us now because you did tease that out, Carla. What yes, was yes. the one time that you didn't follow the actual history? My first novel, I learned. <laughs> Well, I made an error. I'll tell you about it later. But my first novel, um, uh, it's called Daughter of, Daughter of Fortune, not yeah. what I named it. What happened, the uh, the Spanish settlers that, that survived the, the massacre uh, from the Pueblo Indians gathered in Santa Fe. Uh, it was hard. And um, in the actual historical account, they well, they drove, they drove off the Pueblos far enough. And, and then they stayed at Santa, they stayed in Santa Fe for another, at least another week. And in my mind, I thought, no, I want these people. They've won that battle. The Pueblo have been driven back. We're going to hightail it out of there now. So I had them leaving the very second day. I mean, the next day after they drove off the Indians. It seemed logical to me, but it's not true. So <laughs> and, you um, it from one day to one week. I, I love this. Yeah, yeah. And it bothered me forever. But but I, yeah, it seemed more logical and, um, and I've confessed to it now. And, and, but this is something that probably nobody would know or even care about particularly, except me. And but I'm the one that's doing the writing. <laughs> so yeah. Okay, here's my big error. In um, uh, Mrs. McVinney's London season, she goes, um, uh, she's, uh, she's a Scottish, anyway, that's a family name, uh, Jeannie McVinney. She goes from Scotland to, to, um, uh, to help out some, uh, kind of be a nanny down there in, in London. And the daughter is, is just about ready for a come out and all the issues there. And there's a younger boy. And, and, and she takes him to the, to the Tower of London just to do some sightseeing. And she says, uh, uh, this is where Mary Queen of Scots lost her head. Oh, well, no, <laughs> you're shaking your head. You know better than I did. <laughs> I assume, you know what they say with that word assume. Yep. Um, a year, years later, I, I heard from a, a friend of mine called Don Adams. So, he called me and he said, Mrs. Kelly, do you know that Mary, Queen of Scots, lost her head at Fotheringay Castle? Click. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I didn't. Um, but through the magic of reprint, I was able to correct that in, in the edition that came out a little later and it's corrected. But, oh, I, I hate when that happens. And it doesn't happen too often, but he got me. <laughs> well, we're not... There's. Readers are fierce. That's all I can say. It's like, oh, we, yeah. you know, especially the history. Like, I feel like I learned my, you know, a lot of the history from reading romance. And then most of it yeah. is very true. And occasionally you get a, you know, a little bit of a bummer. Um, <laughs> Karen says, talk about frontier lady stories, your experiences at Fort Laramie. I laugh every time I read the story where the new wife gets outranked and the story where the husband has had to get his wife out of jail. So <laughs> can you talk about that a little bit? Well, not out of jail. That's she's make, mixing up two stories. Um, uh, uh, Feel les joies, one where he gets her out of jail, and the other one is some. Um, let's remember that. Um, let me look real quick. Oh, it's called "Such Brave Men." Oh, when when I was a ranger at um, at Fort Laramie, what we did we did living history. We would dress up in period clothing. We depending on the building. Some buildings, and they're all restored buildings. They're original buildings. Um, um, I would sit usually at the end of the officer's row and sit on the porch there and chat with visitors, um, uh, portraying a, the wife of a captain dressed in my 1876 outfit and so on and so on. And, um, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, one other thing we decided to do one summer was to add uh, uh, one day, uh, they put a, uh, uh, we put a tent on the parade ground and packed in a lot of stuff you'd have at the cot and other things and put it in there. And the idea was to represent um, um, a woman who, whose husband has been ranked out of quarters, meaning he was, um, um, oh, well, in this case, I think he was a second lieutenant, um, 
have graduated from West Point at the same time as this other lieutenant from West Point, but the other lieutenant had better grades at West Point and graduated higher so he could outrank the other guy. And this is true. <laughs> so that's what happens. So, uh, so I'm portraying this, this poor woman who's sitting in a tent. She's been ranked out of quarters. So uh, that's, that's how such brave men, um, such brave men came to life because of that experience. Then I did something else. Uh, I've never done this. Then. Well, never had a reason to do this. Um, I asked our superintendent there um, um, at the fort, could I spend the night there in that tent sometime? I mean, he said, yeah, you can do that. But don't, I would not let, uh, see, there are guards that patrol the fort at night. Uh, uh, that park service is very careful about those things. So he said, probably better not let anybody know you're there. So I didn't. I, I stayed in my tent all night. And, and they, uh, they had bugle calls um, uh, that, that were part of the PA system. And, and, and there's Reveille in the morning and I got up. So I had the experience of actually doing that. So when I describe it in the story, it's pretty accurate. Except I didn't have a snake in my bed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the fun of it. <laughs> yeah, so Mary Lynn has another question. So, I mean, and this is sort of a pile onto that, although I think having snakes in your bed is going a little bit too far in your accuracy of research, I'll just say that, um, <laughs> is very clearly you have great respect for history and oh, yeah. great uh, adoration and love of it. So when you're writing your fiction, um, does this make you more or less willing to use real characters and real incidents in your fiction? How much do you have to deal with shaping the fictional characters to the real story versus saying it's not going to work and I have to drop that. How does that work for you? That's a very good, you're pretty good at this. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, how do you put your characters with, you have to really, you have to really know the real people, do the research, do all the research, even well, uh, I give a talk now and then about this subject, and uh, I use a picture of an iceberg. Um, as we all know, the, the iceberg part that's above ground, uh, above water, is far less than all the stuff that's underneath. It's the same way with historical research. You do it all, and you know you're only going to use, there's so much more down there that you can't use, uh, but it informs everything you write that you do use, and and so that's that's kind of what happens, but let me let me give you something I, I did. And this is something I wanted to mention to you. Uh, let me dig it up here. Oh, here we go. There's a really good writer. Uh, his name is Richard Woodman, um, who's written a lot of stories, uh, uh, some some stories. He wrote a series of, uh, about, a. Uh, it's kind of like Horatio Hornblower. His name is Nathaniel Drinkwater. And it's his, this is history uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, starting from midshipman days up to well, finally his death. Um, but um, he said this, and, and actually he, he knows history. He, he was a captain, he's still alive, but he's, uh, he's retired. He was a captain um, uh, with something called Trinity House, which I've used in, in those um, Unlikely Master Genius books um, uh, in charge of lighthouses and other things. He said this, um, let's see. He was comparing his series uh, to C.S. Forster's Rachel Hornblower. Um, the difference sprang from my desire to truly reflect the reality of the sea life of the period, not just some romanticized version of it, but also from a strong urge to insert my imaginary naval protagonist into the very fabric of recorded history. That is what I believe a historical novel should attempt. It is a flight of fancy permitted to historical authors to include the minor as well as the major figures of history. The idea that if you know your, your real character well enough, you can put your fictional character up right next to him and your fictional character becomes real. Can I give you an example? I can find it. Ah. Ah. <laughs> I love this book. Um, Courting Carrie in Wonderland. Um, we have a uh, sergeant major, which is a very high rank um, for a non-commissioned officer. And, um, um, and there's Carrie in the story. She's a, she's a student at uh, Montana Agricultural College, which is now Montana State University in Bozeman. And, um, and, and, I and, and this is April of 1903, when Theodore Roosevelt happened to be in the park, Yellowstone Park, um, 
and and he he um he got wind of what was going on they were built they um the army um uh, uh, captain chittenden he was the corps of engineers guy a brilliant man well we're building an arch at the north entrance oh which took a beating this summer um at the north entrance and since he's he's there uh, the acting superintendent uh, a guy named major pitcher um says well yeah uh, uh, would you mind just coming and dedicating that arch since you're here and that's why it's called the roosevelt arch those of you that have been there and seen it um so um so my sergeant major has come there with his troops and um uh, his name is ramsey styles let me just read you part of this um, after an effusive introduction by Major Pitcher, who knew Roosevelt well, and he did, the great man himself stepped forward, notes in hand. True to form, he leaned over the wooden railing, shook a few hands, and made some laughing remarks. Ramsey smiled when the president even kissed the baby some father held up. Uh, Ramsey searched, he's on horseback, uh, uh, Ramsey searched the crowd again and rose in the saddle when he heard a commotion and glimpsed sudden movement. Uh, uh, two men hung on to a bearded old boy with a bottle in one hand and a gun in the other. Uh, the man broke free and started for the stand. Sergeant Major Stiles stepped from his horse onto the platform. Uh, uh, quicker than speech, he pushed Roosevelt behind him. He stood in front of the president, shielding him from the drunk. He'd thrown, uh, the drunk, he'd thrown away his bottle and stopped not 10 feet away, blinking his eyes and swaying, gun in hand. There was no time to take out his Navy Colt, so Ramsey Stiles stood still ready for whatever came, calm because he knew the president of the United States was behind him and protected. It was all a soldier could do. Um, to his relief and others in the crowd tackled the drunk and disarmed him and so on. Um, then Ramsey sighed with relief and then he turned around to face President Roosevelt. I'm sorry that happened, Mr. President. Gardner is a no account town. Western rough and tumble, Roosevelt said calmly enough. I remember it well from my Dakota days. He held out his hand. Shake, Sergeant Major. Thank you for your vigilance. He gave his toothy grin, the one that signaled to the other dignitaries that all was well. He lowered his voice for Ramsey's ears only. This little incident will never make it into any newspaper or history book. Well, it never happened. <laughs> um, but you were ready to protect me with your life. Ramsey shook hands with President Theodore Roosevelt. I'd do it again, sir. I know you would. I see it in your eyes. So there we have a real incident, Theodore Roosevelt dedicating that arch, and I, my fictional character, runs right up next to him, and it it gives a verisimilitude to the whole story. So that's what Richard Woodman's saying: um, is you can insert your characters next to the real people, but you got to know your characters, and you got to know those real people. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the fun of historical fiction. So, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> um, Liz actually has a question about the necklace to take a little bit of a turn. Oh, the necklace. Okay. Yeah. Pull it out. All right, oh, Liz. Oh. All, right. All right, Liz. So, okay. How hard was this for you? I'm serious. Like, because the editing process was so, I mean, uh, okay. A, a little backstory. I hmm, this book is actually thirty years old. <laughs> yeah, it is roughly, <laughs> and it just got published what yep. two years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. How hard was this for you? <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, during the editing process, because I mean, I, I remember the OG. I totally do. Um, I read it. I cried a lot. I cried yeah, a lot so anyway. So I just, I, how hard was that editing process for you? Please. Go well, I, I, I love to write about Spain, Spain and the new world, Spain. And, and historically uh, the, the reconquest of Spain from the Moors is fascinating. 7-Eleven to 1492, two years. Spain had to unite more as they were a series of city states and to unite as a country in order to drive out the Moors. Um, but I wanted to write an epic. And uh, and at the time, and I won't go into it, I was going through kind of a bleak period in my life. So it's a violent story. So that's one reason I'm one of the most mild-mannered people you could ever hope to know, because I take it out in my stories. <laughs> <laughs> and I did in that one. But interestingly enough, and and it, um, I was writing for Signet at the time, and the editor was really, came to me, she was really upset about this. She said, it's 
it's halfway between a commercial book and a literary book. So we can't quite justify it. And I thought, well, that's fine, whatever. I stuck it in a drawer, the famous drawer, and um, pull it out years later. I just, why not take a look at it? And I thought, yeah, Don on, this is a good book. So <laughs> I, my editor in Seattle, oh, she's, she's a, she can be a meanie, but she's absolutely right most of the time. She said, well, spoiler alert, um, you got the wrong person dying at the wrong time. I said, oh, really? And I thought, oh, so I, I whined a lot and complained, but she was right. So I changed, uh, changed quite a bit of that story. And it became, I think, a better story. She was right. I hate to admit it sometimes. She was right. But, um, and the same thing happened with <laughs> her smile, which came out a year ago. Story of the Nez Perce. Mm -hmm. Um, their flight to, to almost the Canadian border. I wrote that. Um, I'd written a bunch of short stories. I, I picked up a couple spur awards for my short stories. And um, I had a great idea for a novel. Um, oh, they had a contest at, uh, I think they still do at Western Rise of America for um, a first novel. So I, I, I wrote that. I did, it was called Bright Sky at the time. I wrote that and uh, submitted it. it it was a finalist, but it didn't win. So I stuck it in the drawer next to the other book in the drawer and pulled it out um, a couple, about three years ago when our daughter, Mary Ruth, and her family came through and went to Yellowstone. And she, she had read that book when she was about 15, my manuscript. She said, Mom, do you still have that? You know, you ought to look at it. <laughs> so when they left, I thought, oh, do I have it? Do I have it? I scrambled around. Yep, yeah, there it was. And I read it. And in the intervening, again, about 30 years, well, more than that, about 30 years, um, partly through my, my research, my graduate school, partly through working as a ranger and in, involved in Indian Wars. I knew a whole lot more about Indian Wars and about Indians. And um, so, I, uh, so I, I didn't have a, all I had was this manuscript, a typewritten copy. So as I retyped it, I rewrote it. And it became I think a pretty good story because I knew more about my, oh, here comes my cat, <laughs> knew more about my story, uh, about the people I was writing about. So yeah, it's kind of weird. You know, the, those are my two books that were in the drawer and they, they're published now and I'm very happy with both of them. Mm. But uh, I, uh, I, in the intervening years, I, I changed and so my stories changed. Actually, I'm going to um, just do a follow-up part of that question is that is uh, you had said that back when you first wrote the necklace, it was a kind of bleak time for you. So like when you were, when you found it 30 years later and you were in a different place emotionally and mentally and all of that, um, how did that affect the rewriting of the story? Hmm. Well, that came with a change. I have to, you know, read the book, but I, I'm not spoiling it too bad. Uh, she is, um, she's a daughter of a um, uh, her name is Hanukkah. She's a daughter of a, of a Dutch merchant who has aspirations of, of grandeur. <laughs> and um, and in that time in Spain, um, they were the, the coffers were pretty low in the, the treasuries and they were trying to raise troops. And in, so the thing was, and this fellow Santiago is a short tail relative of, of the king of, of, which one was it? It was the Castile man, I can't recall. And so she is married to Santiago. Neither of them want this, but it happens. And so about halfway through the story, you know, stuff happens. <laughs> That's an novelist trait. And, and he dies. Um, oh, excuse me. I apologize. He, he does not die. Um, in my, my manuscript, the one who dies is a fellow named Antonio, who's a kind of a, a sidekick to Santiago. Antonio has no background whatsoever. Um, but Antonio dies and, and, and Santiago kind of pursues her because she flees because she's, she's so upset with what, what has happened um, with, his, with the death of this person that she, did she love? Probably. They never did consummate that, but, um, and, and then the story goes from there where she, she becomes reconciled to Santiago and he to her. But my, my editor said, no, the wrong person died. It's got to be Santiago. And so that did change the story. Um, it did. It softened it in some ways, in other ways, not at all. Um, but again, it's like uh, it's like that Thomas Hardy theory. If you want your happy ending, you've got to work a little harder for it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that even begins to answer what you're asking, but that's so it did. Yeah, it, it changed the story. 
but that's the thing about writing. Um, you can be inflexible and say, oh, no, it's perfect the way it is. I won't change it. Uh, I'll self-publish. Many will buy it. No, they won't. Um, or you can listen to people and know more than you do. And I, I do that. Mm-hmm. It works. It definitely does. <laughs> I got to tell you one thing else. Just one more comment. Um, somebody told me this. Um, a friend, well, she was just an acquaintance. had come to one of my one of my discuss- talks. And she was moving to Israel. And she moved to Israel. And I got an email from her saying, say, the only books I took with me were your novels. Uh, well, well, novels. Because they're so rereadable. I never thought about that. And, and during the pandemic, I reread a lot of my own novels. And I thought, yeah, golly, this is a pretty good story. <laughs> they are re- they're rereadable. I don't know why, but they are. Because you make you feel I can say, like, I feel a connection to your characters and your story. And I like to reread it again because I I I feel like I know them already. And mm-hmm. I also know the ending, so I, you know, it's not as <laughs> It's not, Joel. <laughs> it's not such a it's not a, as emotionally taxing as it might have been the first time I read it <laughs> yeah. yeah but yeah. yeah there's always that that sort of comfort um in that um so we're we have about 10 more minutes so I'm going to take a couple more questions and um and comments Mary Lynn says what did you think of Harlequin's graphic novel versions of a couple of your stories <laughs> oh they just make me laugh <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I, what do I what do I say um, no, they do. I just actually, uh, Liz, my daughter Liz, and my daughter Sarah. Um, yes. I was approached by. <laughs> I was oh, approached by um, the um, Korean publisher. Yeah, and well, they it, came... it was a Japanese publisher. They wanted Japanese. me. To, well, what do you call it? Um, oh, um, the, anime. the manga, anime. manga, 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 and anime. manga. They're manga. And, yeah. and and I th- I got this. I thought. What in the world? And my daughter said, "Oh, mom, please, please, please." I was right. flabbergasted because I know. I mean, I I have some manga. I, I'm not a huge, but I was like, I was flabbergasted. I was like, "Mom, are you kidding me? Yes, are you is. kidding me?" I did. And yeah, so, mm-hmm. so I did. thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you gotta do it. You know, well, it's I, a whole other audience. I don't for, really for make younger money readers. On. My daughter was was how she encountered your books was because she read the manga version. <laughs> my goodness you see this was so beyond me and it still is but but that was kind of well you never know what's going to happen it's interesting (laughs) i see karen's unmuted did you want to make a comment or a question yeah i wanted uh uh, to ask carla uh, and when when we meet again the voice of the heroines changes from the voice (laughs) that you use in your other books they yeah. have that uh, World War II optimism, naivete, whatever it is, gung ho voice. How yeah, do you yeah. do that? Research. You research. You, you read. You read. You read uh, personal accounts. You read. Um, yeah, it's it's research. And and, and, and listen it's, to it, your mother. <laughs> yes, <laughs> did that too. Oh uh, yeah, I had my sisters. Uh, both of them uh, call me in tears about this book. Um, it's two short, two lengthy short stories about, um, about World War II, which is certainly a departure. I've never gone that far into the century than <laughs> World War II. But, um, and, and Karen, it was you that said something that, um, that touched my heart. You said, these are, you've written into these characters things that our folks did. And the only people who know this are the three of us. Yeah. <laughs> so it touched my heart to do that. But yeah, I did some of the things and I wouldn't point them out now, but yeah. But there was that optimism. It, it was a good war. Um, but how fun it was to write about that, that, that second short story about the, uh, uh, um, about the PW camp in south, um, southeast Wyoming, which was there. And I got so lucky there. Um, I have uh, historians cultivate other historians. I have a good friend there. And I, I contacted Don. He taught where my husband did there at the community college, taught history. And I said, Don, do you know anybody who's still alive and who's sentient, who um, who could tell me something about that PW camp? And he says, Yeah, I know the guy that's you know, who farmed right next to the camp. So he put me in touch with Dave Eddington, who just turned ninety nine, I think. And Dave was lucid and sharp, and we talked that afternoon about about the camp. And he said, This you'll like this. I didn't think I put in the story. He said, yeah, there's some Italians first, and 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 uh, we all like the Italians, but they, they didn't work very hard. <laughs> but everybody really liked the Germans. They were efficient and liked the work. So 
yeah, I I'd wanted to write those stories. Uh, you know, your part. book is going like wildflower around Westminster Winter Park. Good. This is a, a a retirement community. Yeah, and one of the gentlemen said my father had prisoner of war uh, people working on his farm. Too. Many did. Many yeah. did, but it's not a story that everybody knows. That's the interesting thing. Yeah, obviously, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, but um, when I lived in, when I'm working at Fort Laramie, and um, I was I was a liaison from the fort to the Goshen County Historical Society, and that's where I met some people who set me on the story that I knew I'd write someday, and I did, and it was a pleasure. <laughs> so Bonnie says she lived through the period when we meet again, and it is a way we were then naive, optimistic, uh -huh. no doubt for the future. Yeah. Yeah. And then Marilyn asks, you've mentioned Hardy and Heyer. Who are your other favorite authors and what's one nonfiction book you wish we'd all pick up and read? I know we talked about uh, a book a little, little bit recently. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, my escape reading is um, crime fiction. It just is. Um, I like Michael Connolly, uh, Robert Crace, who has a new book out I can't wait to read. Yeah, you do. And um, uh, Peter Robinson, he's, uh, I think he lives in Canada. Very good writer. I like crime fiction. Um, I'd love to write it, but I nah, don't have that kind of skill. Um, so, yeah, that's, so romance writers, I don't read romance. So oh, no, I, she I, said uh, nonfiction. Oh, excuse me. No, okay, nonfiction. I, yeah, I mentioned that one to you. Um, uh, Adam Makos, that's M A K O S, um, his, uh, he wrote a book called Devotion. Uh, set, uh, it's true, I mean, this is all history. Um, uh, the, the Korean War, and this is around the time of the Battle of Chosin Reservoir. And it, it's the story, the true story, of a, an African American um, pilot who was the first US Navy fighter pilot. Uh, and it's going to be out as a movie now on November 27th. I am going to be first in line because um, uh, so that devotion is an excellent book. He also wrote one which I like even a little better. Um, um, it's called A Higher Call, and it's about a, um, uh, a German Messerschmitt 109 pilot who interacts with, with, a, um, with an American named Charlie Brown. Uh, his first, first, first attack over Berlin is trying to get his desperately beat up plane back to England, and he, he flies underneath that plane and uh, allows the pilot to get away, and, they, and years later they meet. Wonderful book a higher call. I recommend those two. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I have one last question about what all we've been talking about is given your historical research and, you know, your deep dives into history, what made you choose historical romance versus historical fiction to write? Well, to me, they're, they're just so close. Um, but I'd written so many, <laughs> well, I'll leave it to my readers. I'd written so many novels so uh, uh, those regency romances and, and i'm an optimistic person i kind of like a little romance but you know what's fun and what i've done in several of my novels is i don't like it when they get married and that's the end of the book i like to get them in the marriage and carry and that's why that's why the um able six and meredy are so much fun because we get to see them growing and developing as husband and wife and I enjoy doing that. Um, so that's that's something a lot of romance writers, I suspect, don't do. But you know, what I do, I like it. <laughs> I, I just have always written what I'm because I've never been I've never been influenced by a particular romance writer. So I do my own thing. Mm -hmm. Always have. <laughs> right, well, Liz. <laughs> may I? Oh, if I, I may. Make, okay. Make it quick. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So, so, so years ago, mom was sent like an author, read her book and then put your blurb on it. And then uh, mom gave it to me and mom and I both read this thing. Oh, and it was, yeah. I, I don't remember the author, but we had oh, such a great time with this novel. In fact, we still quote it to this day. She whirled into the room. Yeah, she rolled into the room. She elevated her slender nose. We still quote that. that yes. Um, <laughs> so, so needless to say, mother did not give a quote for this book. <laughs> I, 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 I don't Good. usually do a blurb because I just, no. <laughs> they don't, but people have been very kind to do blurbs for me. So I appreciate it. I should be nicer. I'm sorry. You never <laughs> ele elevated your slender nose. I mean, well. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, the, you'll notice my style is my style is is pretty journalistic. 
Um, and, and if I had written Elevated Her Slender Nose and, and Miss D had read that, uh, she'd have flogged me with a <laughs> with a cat of nine tails, but I'd have deserved it. <laughs> oh, yeah, you all have, I mean, every book has its own style and, and um, different readers are looking for different things in their books. But I sort of feel like we could do like a take two on this in this talk, because I feel like I, I only got to like two of my questions. And I know uh, uh, everybody here probably has more questions. So we'll have to talk, Carla, about doing another one, because I never got to ask you about the lotions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, Carla makes her own lotions. She has sent me a bunch of them. <laughs> Mrs. Kelly's novel hand cream. What a great title. That's my husband. I asked him, I don't want lousy titles. So what do I call his hand cream? Well, Mrs. Kelly's novel hand cream. So on the back, it says the plot thickens. And then that's, that's the description of what's in it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you make, I mean, like aside from like everything else you do, you make lotions and you send them to people like me who are just like some schmo at a library. Yeah, I'll send so. you some. <laughs> <laughs> I do love them. They, you always pick the best sense for them. But I mean, it's just, you're just like this Renaissance person. I just think it's amazing. So we will have to talk about like maybe doing this another time again and ask many, many more questions. <laughs> oh, I'd love, I'd love to. <laughs> oh, awesome. Okay. You all heard it here. We're going to do it again. So I yeah. will be in touch, but um, Carla, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate everybody's questions and thoughtfulness and um, we are having a blast. So we will have to do it again. So yeah, I we, hope you all have a wonderful night, Carla. Have a good dinner. I, I feel like I can smell it from here. <laughs> it's meatloaf. I can smell it. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and good to see, good to, good to, Mary Lynn, I got to meet you. You sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> Who, me or some, oh uh, yeah no this is Lynn and susan good to see you and my sister would, and my I'm daughter telling you, north dakota gotta knock it off my list <laughs> oh I, I enjoyed working there <laughs> well we will hopefully see you all again at some point but um in the meantime have a wonderful night and happy reading um carla your book uh the world war ii stories is out now do you have another yes, one coming is. up anytime soon uh pardon do you have any, any another book coming out anytime soon? No, um, I think probably in the spring we'll get that first uh, reprint, uh, Libby's London Merchant. And I'm not sure just when, March or April or May. Okay. And I've been slowing down a bit on on writing. My husband's not in very good health. So we're, I have to go to a lot of doctor's appointments. and <laughs> That takes my time. Yeah. But don't, I'm coming. And that fourth um, Master Genius book, give me a little time. I'll get it done. We're here for it. We're here okay. For it. Thank you so much. Most importantly, just for a moment, I think on behalf of all of us, I want to say thank you to Mina for her tireless efforts yes. in arranging events like these that can be shared with readers everywhere. I think she deserves not only our gratitude, but our deep respect for her continuing effort and for her support of the genre. Yes. Now you're going to make you. me cry. <laughs> oh, no, I totally agree. Mina, we, we got to meet in person one of these days. Absolutely. Maybe we meet somewhere in the middle in a, our own little Winnebago's. <laughs> yeah, you, you come out here to the Yellowstone. Everybody does. <laughs> I will. I will definitely. So Good. again, thank you. And I will uh, talk to you, Carla, soon. And I hope to okay. see you all in cyberspace at some point in the near future. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good night, everybody. <laughs>